Eva, thank you so much for uh, joining us this evening. Uh, are you still there? I am still here, and it's nice to see you again, Najamu. I think the last time was well over a year ago. Yes, and we were in um, in Lebanon at that mo moment. Yes. So thank you so much for for joining me this evening. Um, um, briefly say a little bit about yourself, and then I'm going to then we have our our conversation. How what yeah. what brought you to this work and and what have you been doing for the last uh, year? Yeah, um, Ajama, I'm actually glad the way you phrase it, a people's journalist, because that's really the approach I take. Like, I um, obviously I try to be as factual as possible, but um, I really want to convey the voices we're not hearing. And you know, with regard to Syria, in terms of corporate media, we're not hearing the Syrian voices. We're hearing all these slick, um, well-funded campaigns that um, um, that claim to be the Syrian voices. But if you actually go to Syria, what you hear on the ground is very different than what you know Al Jazeera or Channel 4 or Fox or CNN or Democracy Now or any of these um, both corporate and so-called independent media tell us is happening in Syria. So uh, since April 2014 I've gone to Syria six times, um, twice with delegations uh, and the other four times I've applied for, paid for, waited for a journalist visa and then gone on my own by shared taxi from Beirut to Damascus. And uh, this past summer, I actually, um, applying for the visa and then extending the visa, I was able to stay in Syria for a couple of months and travel extensively um, in areas, you know, obviously I wasn't in areas occupied by ISIS or others in, uh, you know, of Al-Qaeda nature, but I was in many key areas that, you know, people, I think they would want to know, you know, hear what the Syrians there are saying. Homs, uh, which I'd been to in April and June 2014, and December 2015, and Aleppo. I went to Aleppo four times in uh, twice this summer and then twice when I went back in November this year. November, October, I was there for about um, one month collectively. So, you know, I had a lot of opportunity, especially with regard to Aleppo, to get a sense of the hell that they were living um, under the reign of these different militant factions and uh, a sense of, you know, what they were hoping for. And, and you will probably get into that, but, you know, what they were hoping for was an end to the, as they say, terrorism. You know, on a daily basis, they were being bombarded by these different militant factions. Before we get into that, though, Eva, let's, let's make sure that we, we sort of uh, lay the, the ground. So Aleppo is divided, was divided into, into two. Talk about that. Yeah, you know, it, uh, that's an interesting point, too. That's something, the division of Aleppo was something that most Aleppo uh, Syrians rejected. And this is a theme throughout Syria. They reject any sort of divis division or sectarianism. It's been foisted upon them from, with, you know, from outside, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Turkey, and, of course, the NATO alliance. Uh, but within Aleppo, okay, so there was geographically more or less a division in the sense that in um, mid-2012, different militant factions occupied areas of eastern Aleppo, eastern areas of Aleppo, also northern and southern areas. But it became known, you know, simplified in the corporate media as East and West Aleppo. Now, an important point about that is, um, in general, when, when corporate media and Western leaders talked about Aleppo, they were talking solely and exclusively about the eastern areas. They weren't talking about the greater Aleppo, which comprised at least a million and a half people. One other point to note is that even the United Nations, and this doesn't really come as a surprise if you're following Syrian, uh, the war on Syria, even the United Nations um, grossly exaggerated the number of people in eastern Aleppo. For years they've said, we know that there are 270,000 uh, civilians in eastern Aleppo. Now in December, all of Aleppo was secured by the Syrian army and allies, and at most, if we're going to be generous, 130,000, maybe 140,000 people came out of those areas. So it's still, you know, even if you want to be generous and say 150,000, you're still short 120,000 people. Where are they? These, and this is an important point because when you inflate the numbers, that means there's that more many, many more people that, you know, concerned people in the West are caring about, you know, because that's the whole thing. Um, so yeah. anyway, um, the, the West, you know, greater Aleppo, one other point I think people should know is that, you know, for the past year, we've heard about the siege of Eastern Aleppo the military siege on militant factions, factions in Eastern Aleppo. What was never highlighted was the many attempts by the Syrian army and the Russians to enable um, citizens to evacuate from Eastern Aleppo. And I personally went to one of the humanitarian crossings that was shelled twice while I was there at very close proximity. So I'm lucky I'm here today. Yeah, uh, you know, Eva, one of, one of the things that we, we, we noticed when uh, the, the 
uh, east of Aleppo was in fact um, uh, taken control of by the Syrian army was that for those of us who are exposed to the alternative press, uh, what was what was interesting was that many of the stories that we heard um, from uh, people who were trapped in East Aleppo uh, were that in fact they were made aware of the uh, uh, humanitarian uh, corridors uh, that they were supposed to be able to uh, take advantage of and leave. But the stories seem to be consistent that uh, they were unable to leave because of the activities of the of the militants there in, in uh, East Aleppo. And so it, it, it seems like there was this clash of, of, of narratives. And one of the things that uh, we wanted to talk about this evening was you know, we, we know that there are, there's information that's, that's circulating. And we see that um, this information seems to be sort of uh, consumed by uh, people in the West uh, and in the U.S., uh, uncritical in terms of, of its sources. Where yeah. was the information coming from uh, out of uh, Aleppo specifically uh, yeah. in terms of yeah. what was really happening on the ground? Well, that's, that's a really good point that many... Um, Many people don't think to ask because they get it, you know, uncritically thinking or for lack of time or whatever from our media sources um, proclaiming these are the facts. But who are the sources? I just want to make one quick note. Also, when I was in Aleppo in November on my fourth trip there, I did interview two different families that said exactly what you said. They had tried to flee prior. They tried to escape the militant factions and they'd been violently prevented one family twice and another family four times. So they, they wanted to leave. They wanted to go to the government areas, but they couldn't get out. Um, mm -hmm. Most of the sources that our media has been relying on have been anyone from the White Helmets, which are portrayed as rescuers and neutral, and yet they're um, and they're portrayed as a grassroots group of, of Syrians that are just trying to do their bit for the community. But in fact, um, they're funded by well over $100 million from the West, you know, UK, US, EU, etc., and they're not neutral. They're only in Al-Nusra areas, and many of them you can find them holding weapons. Um, you, you can find the same white helmet person in another photo on their Facebook profiles or other social media holding weapons and participating with, with militant groups. Um, and you can find them also standing on dead Syrian soldiers' bodies. So they're by no means neutral, but they have been a key source of this misinformation. Channels like um, the UK Channel 4, which also had its own reporters like Bilal Abdul Karim, um, a so-called independent journalist that was embedded with Nusra and, you know, Nuruddin and Zinki and other terrorist groups and praising them, essentially. Um, and another group called the Aleppo Media Center, AMC. You'll see the logo on many of the, 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 media, the um, sorry, videos that were supposedly coming out of Aleppo. And this group is also funded by, the, you know, France, the, the, the UK, etc., um, another source of information, and this is, you know, one of the most astounding sources of information, was a seven-year-old child named Bana al Abid, and we were led to believe that Bana, whose Twitter account began in September of last year, and which blossomed to, you know, tens of thousands of followers immediately, we're led to believe that this seven-year-old kid was uh, tweeting phrases like, you know, end the genocide, uh, we want a no-fly zone, you know, very NATO um, alliance phrases. You know, later it came out, well, no, her mother was helping her with it. Turns out Bana's father was one of the militants. So again, not an impartial source. And just in my own personal, you know, having been to Aleppo four times, every time I went to Aleppo, and this is in government secured Aleppo, granted they didn't have electricity, they were, su they were surviving on generators in government secured Aleppo, but every time I went, it was a struggle to open my email, let alone to tweet something. And Bana sometimes was tweeting 10, 20 more times a day from Eastern mm -hmm. Aleppo. So she was one of the sources we were being told and other activists that said they were in Aleppo. But, you know, we were basically told to believe unnamed activists and the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights, which is based in the UK and has no actual people on the ground. And even, you know, none of the international institutions had people on the ground in Aleppo. They all relied on so-called unnamed activists. Okay, okay. Eva, let's go ahead and, 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 and move on to the uh, Q&A portion of, of our show. Sure. Uh, this is where we, are, we allow and encourage our, uh, our activists to uh, pose questions. Uh, and we have a number of questions that are, in fact, uh, beginning to come in. Uh, and this will give you a chance to to elaborate on some of the points that you were making sure. uh, so far. 
So let's uh, as move to that. Um, let's see. Uh, Dave asked the question, uh, what is your view of the Obama administration supporting the rebels in Syria? Uh, does this shift the balance of power away from the despotic regime uh, to the even more despotic force of ISIS? Do you see any flaws in this strategy? Even? Yeah, where to begin? Um, I would encourage listeners or viewers to look at the report of a German journalist, I forget his name offhand, but a few months ago, he, um, Toddenheimer or something like that, he interviewed a top al-Nusra, al-Qaeda commander, who essentially said, yes, we get weapons from the U.S. This is al-Nusra. This is not moderate rebels. This, He said, you know, we get the weapons, whether it's tow missiles or whatever else he's talking about, um, from the U.S. And, you know, he said he wanted more. Um, the whole notion that the U.S. is training uh, rebels is completely a farce by now. And by the way, the U.S.-led coalition has accidentally airdropped supplies to ISIS themselves on many occasions. And in September, the U.S.-led coalition attacked a Syrian army base for nearly one hour. They killed at least 80 Syrian soldiers. They knew it was a Syrian army base, and ISIS took over the base right away. So you're saying that basically uh, you're suggesting that the, the U.S. is directly involved in funding uh, these forces, even though they know that these uh, these elements uh, are either uh, directly tied to al-Qaeda and ISIS or, or in fact, in many cases, are in fact al-Qaeda. And if that's yeah. the case, why isn't that uh, being uh, more widely uh, discussed uh, in the U.S.? Well, I mean, it has been uh, discussed. Uh, I think even the New York Times made reference to a 2012 DIA, which is Defense Intelligence a Agency declassified document, which itself noted the, that the U.S. supported the rise of so-called Islamic extremists. And we know that ISIS are not really Islamic extremists. They're a, a, a mercenary group that are operating in the name of, of um, extreme Islam, but they, of course, don't represent Islam. But um, anyway, the point being that the U.S. in their own internal documents were saying if if the rise of this, um, you know, extremist Islamist were to occur in Syria, essentially it would be a good thing. It would be a way to topple the government. It would be something they would support. Um, I, I personally haven't read the whole bit about the Clinton emails, but I know there's some pretty damning ev evidence in that. Um, Seymour Hirsch is an investigative journalist, and I don't know his history, like, but I do believe he used to be published in The New Yorker or other mainstream publications. But since he started critically writing about um, Syria, perhaps Libya, but certainly Syria, he's published in the London Review of Books, the LRB, and he's done some also damning investigative work um, showing the trail of weapons from Libya through Turkey to so-called rebels in Syria. And, you know, he's spoken about that which is not spoken of on CNN, Fox News, etc. So it's not being talked about because this agenda, the U.S. supporting, you know, opposition, what they call opposition, has been in effect since prior to 2011. And well, it, let, me know, this, go ahead. Uh, let me follow up. Follow, there, there's a question that, that, that Pat has that... Uh, is related to what you just said, and that is that if, if, if in fact the U.S., France, Qatar, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, Turkey have been directly involved in funding, uh, arming, supporting uh, groups that are uh, have been identified as being part of this international terrorist network and al-Qaeda specifically, uh, why isn't there some move by the International Criminal Court or other entities to uh, to bring these 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 states and the leaders of these states uh, to justice. I can't really speak to the ICC, but let's take the UN as an example because it's supposed to be you know the uni universal. It, it's supposed to be the body that um, prevents genocides and prevents war crimes, or at least documents or you know brings peace. The United Nations itself is aware that Israel is treating terrorists in hospitals, in Israeli hospitals, and funneling them back into Syria. Um, they're aware of this because the United Nations has observer forces in the occupied Syrian Golan. And the observer forces had, have documented both the flow of militants um, from Israel into the occupied Syrian Golan and also the back and forth of militants being sent to Israel, being treated in hospitals. Uh, this has been documented even by Sky News or one of the UK channels. But the point being the observer forces have documented this interaction between Israeli soldiers and militants in Syria. And, you know, obviously this is a point of... Um, 
extreme alarm, but nothing happens with it in the UN. UN has been a platform wherein it actively works to silence the Syrian voice, and it, it you know enables the voices of the, the 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 powers that are actually effectively warring on and supporting militants in Syria to have you know have have the voice at the UN. Saudi Arabia is head of the UN um, Human Rights Council. Um, you know Saudi Arabia, Qatar, the EU, the UK. What often you know when the when the Syrian ambassador at the UN gets up to speak, um, the the rest of the parties walk out, and you know. Even uh, there's a technical point I have to mention, and that is that at the United Nations, every government is to be called by its name. So it's the Syri Syrian Arab Republic or the government of Syria. And yet the UN and allows, even though the Syrian ambassador to the UN has, you know, politely demanded that this not occur, the UN allows people to call it the Syrian regime. This is not technically or um, legally correct. So there, there are many um, blatant um, violations by the UN, and there are many nuances. But the fact is that, you know, I don't fully believe in, definitely not in the United Nations. I can't speak to the ICC. I don't know enough about it. Okay. Now, even when you were traveling around uh, the country, and specifically these last couple of uh, visits, uh, Tim wants to know if you were under the direct supervision uh, of Assad uh, government, uh, quote unquote, handlers. Okay, I know I get that question a lot. Um, Damascus is a city that has a lot of military checkpoints, and the reason being there have been and there continue to be in other cities car bombs, etc. So you can't go very far in Damascus without coming across a military checkpoint. That's to say, you know, in Damascus, it's easier for me to walk alone, and I do it all the time, nobody with me, and I encounter people and I talk with people. Um, in other cities, there are different security risks, so it's less easy for me to be alone. That said, any human being can tell when somebody is lying to you or when they're when you feel like they're being forced in what they're saying. The interactions I had in Aleppo, um, if, in fact, the last time I was there, I was with an Aleppo journalist and not with anybody from the Ministry of Information. And I was interacting with Syrians one on one. And I speak Arabic too, you know, moderate colloquial Arabic. So uh, I was interacting with them one on one without any so-called so handlers present. There have been times when there have been um, people from the Ministry of Information with me, but I still maintain that, you know, I go to the Aleppo Medical Association and I talk with the doctors there. They have no reason to, to lie or distort the truth. They, I ask them numbers and they tell me the numbers. I ask for information. They tell me the information. You know, the things I was witnessing in Aleppo had not only to do with the testimonies of people and the testimonies I took of the IDPs from Eastern Aleppo were with a journalist and not with any sort of um, ministry person. But the, you know, the things I was witnessing, the bombing I was witnessing in Aleppo from the militant factions or the people that I was seeing being injured at the hospital, coming into the hospital, you know, it doesn't matter if there is a ministry person there or not. But I get the implication. The implication is that people can't speak freely, but I, I totally disagree with that. And incidentally, I actually traveled to Aleppo on my own in a taxi, just me and the driver on my last visit. You know, we heard we we were getting a lot of information about the uh, 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 so-called barrel bombs and and all of that that uh, the uh, Syrian government allegedly drops uh, in eastern Aleppo, but we saw uh, very little information regarding what some news outlets talked about or described as the indiscriminate uh, fire coming from east Aleppo into government-held western Aleppo. Did you see? Uh, evidence of that, or were you able to experience that directly in terms of those those kind of activities? On various different occasions, I did. On my very first visit in July of this year, um, there was some sort of explosion. I can't say if it was a gas canister bomb, a water heater bomb, or conventional Grad missile supplied, you know, from Turkey. Uh, but it was within um, probably 500 meters of where I was. Um, an explosive bullet landed about 15 meters away. It had exploded in the air, so by the time it landed, it didn't, you know, cause an explosion. But it was very close to some parked cars, so if it had landed on them, I wouldn't be here. Um, on November 3rd, I was it, I was there in Aleppo on a day when there were 18 civilians killed and over 200 wounded by a variety of Grad missiles and then these um, improvised, you know, gas canister and water heater bombs. So, and I, I was at one of the main hospitals and seeing the victims as they came in. So I have had, you know, experience with that. Um, and it's, believe me, it's something people in Aleppo, whoever I was speaking with, would tell me, why doesn't anybody speak about this? Why aren't they talking about our daily suffering? On a daily basis, we're being attacked. Did you happen to see many uh, journalists from the West 
as you moved around the country. I did, in fact, um, on one occasion in on my first visit in April 2014, I saw Lise Doucet, who's a Canadian but works with the BBC. And it's a very notable point that where I saw her, and that was the French hospital in Damascus. And I'd gone there with a few others on this international peace delegation I went with on my very first visit. Um, and the reason we went to the French hospital is that um, militants in Jobar or east of Damascus had been shelling the city. And in 2014 and 2015, on all my vi visits there, I stayed in the old city and I was in the thick of the shelling. It was going on all around me, very close to me. So in this instance, we went to the hospital to see who the victims were. And they were like over 60 children had been injured and one had been killed when one of these mortars hit a school, the al Manar school in Damascus. And Lise Doucet was there. And uh, so there was an interaction with her and somebody else asking her, is she going to tell the truth? And I later saw a report in which she, uh, I can't remember it offhand, she didn't tell the full truth. She said there was a kid injured or kids injured, and she implied that it was unknown where the mortar had come from. And that's clearly not true. Uh, it was very easy to deduce that it came only from the militant occupied areas. Um, in November, I was with a group of journalists in uh, Aleppo. And so, you know, New York Times, LA Times, I'm not sure what other publication, BBC. Um, and I know that the New York Times uh, person, Anne Bernard, did not uh, tell the whole truth. She had to qualify the November 3rd, um, 18 dead, 200 injured with some alleged uh, attacks. And the source of information was the Syrian Observatory in the UK. So, mm -hmm. uh, Eva uh, um, uh, Primilla, Primala would like to know, you know, what is in fact the, the interest of the, of the agenda of the West and NATO uh, in Syria? Um, I have heard different analyses of this. I think um, there's more than one. One of the primary ones is um, securing the area in terms of resources. You know, who controls the area controls the resources and therefore keeps other countries like Russia or China from having those resources. That's one theory I've heard. Um, another is to do with pipelines. Uh, it's the same idea, essentially, pipelines going through the country. So whether it's a pipeline, you know, a Qatar Israeli pipeline going through Syria to Turkey, or whether it's one that has serious interests, that's, that's one other reason I've heard. Um, another has been because Syria has been um, um, historically one of the strongest supporters of Palestine, and Palestinians in Syria have equal rights as Syrian citizens and live like Syrian citizens. But I think also mainly the, um, the support they've given to Palestine and Palestinian resistance uh, is another factor in terms of like breaking up the countries that have an alliance, whether it's Syria, Russia, Iran, um, Vietnam, or sorry, not Vietnam, Venezuela, Cuba. You know, there's many countries that uh, people aren't aware of that are, have been involved in Syria, uh, but in other ways, like sending medical aid to Syria, defying the criminal Western sanctions on Syria. But I mean, um, the prime reasons have nothing to do, absolutely nothing to do with democracy or human rights. That I can attest to. You, you know, Eva, um, people are trying to, uh, you know, figure out for themselves what's really happening in that country. We, we get bombarded with so many different uh, perspectives and narratives. Uh, well, most of them seem to be consistent, though, but the information is so confusing for many people who are not following uh, that situation that closely and not aware of the politics of, of the region. Uh, so Suzanne wants to know, you know, based on your understanding, based on your uh, interaction with the people uh, in that country, what do the people of Syria, what do they really want there? And then let's connect that to the question that uh, Noel has that says, what should the U.S. do or not do there in, in Syria? Nice. Yeah. Um, overwhelmingly, the people I've spoken with have said, we want an end to, and they call it terrorism. Uh, we want an end to the terrorism. We want the West, the U.S., and the other allied nations to stop funding terrorists. We want Turkey to close its borders and stop allowing terrorists to come and go and enter Syria and attack our people. Uh, we, and many, like many, if not most, people have said, we want Syria to be how it was prior to 2011, because then it was the developing um, nation in the Middle East. It was one of the safest in that region, and people could afford to live. You know, the combination of the war on Syria and the sanctions means that people can't afford to live now. So people want an end to the terrorism. And they want people to hear their voices, and they want people to butt out and not come in and tell Syria, you can't choose your own leader. 
you can't, you have to accept Western intervention. Syrians are not stupid, you know, they've seen what's happened to Iraq and Libya. They're well aware that if, you know, the U.S. imposes one of their Western Syrian um, elites as government or if these uh, Wahhabi, you know, Takfiri mercenaries get their way and take over areas of Syria, this is not going to give them, you know, peace, stability, human rights. Women won't have freedom. You know, there's so many things that the, the Western narrative on Syria is just so wrong on every level. And what they claim to be rebels, whether they're Free Syrian Army or, you know, Nusra or ISIS, they're all, cre- you know, committing these heinous crimes against the Syrian people. So what should what, what should people what should what should people in the U.S. support in terms of of U.S. policy toward toward uh, Syria? What should the U.S. do in Syria or not do? You know, I would direct people to the website handsoffsyriacoalition.net because they this is a coalition of various different um, anti-war, anti-imperialist groups. Um, you know, coming at it from different angles, but their essential points of unity are stop interfering in Syria, stop sending terrorists to Syria respect Syrian sovereign right to choose their, their government, you know, and um, lift the sanctions on Syria. These are the essentials. Um, again, the Syrian um, representatives and people themselves maintain if the borders are closed, if terrorists are no longer flowing in from Turkey or, you know, flowing across the desert from Iraq into Syria and the U.S.-led coalition does nothing to stop them. And this has happened, you know, this is how Palmyra was taken over. If the borders were secured and if the West stopped financing terrorism, then there would be an end, you know, then the Syrians could fight the terrorists that are there within or the people that are of Syrian origin, because we have to remember there are terrorists from over 100 countries fighting in Syria in the name of democracy and human rights. But within, you know, with the ter- with the Syrians who have taken up arms, thousands have laid down their arms and taken amnesty and returned to si- Syrian civil sobi- uh, society or joined the Syrian army in fighting against terrorists. Eva, we have about a minute left um, in that last minute. Can you uh, speak to uh, how you see the uh, U.S. policy either remaining consistent or changing under the uh, new uh, Trump administration that's coming into into power in January? I, I, can't, I actually can't. I'm, I'm not. I've been out of Canada. I've been out of North America. And I don't know enough about the new U.S. administration. I've been incredibly busy. So I can't really speak to that. All I can say is that I hope that um, I hope that this administration decides not to support terrorism in Syria and other countries. I hope that the administration would, you know, this is being uh, hopeful, but I think above all, any U.S. administration should start caring about the people and stop funding these wars all around the world. You know, care about your own infrastructure and your own health care. So, but as far as Trump, I don't, I don't know enough. But you know, I'd really like to um, encourage people to look at the the work of uh, a number of people that were in Aleppo. So you can people that were there when it was liberated. You can hear heartbreaking but genuine testimonies and realities from on the ground. Vanessa Beely is one. Uh, Jan Oberg is another. Um, Andrew Ashdown is another. And uh, Tom Dugan is in Syria. I really would encourage people to look at these. I mean, if not Syrians, of course, themselves. And how will they get that information, Eva? Yeah, all those people are on Facebook. So, um, you know, Vanessa Beely, Jan Oberg, O-B-E-R-G, um, Andrew Ashdown, as it sounds, and Tom Dugan, D-U-G-G-A-N. They're all on Facebook, and then you can find some of them, like Vanessa writes for 21st Century Wire. Okay. Yeah. Eva, I want to really uh, uh, thank you for uh, joining us this evening. It's been very, very informative. Uh, we have uh, had a lot of questions. We only got, a, got through a few of those. Uh, but I think that you provided a different perspective, uh, something that people can weigh as they try to uh, figure out to what's happening in that country and uh, be better prepared to uh, determine for themselves what kind of position they should take vis-a-vis uh, the U.S. government in terms of its policies in that country. So, so, country. so thank you so much thank you. Uh, for joining us. Thank all of you for sending in your, your questions. Uh, I encourage you to uh, follow up and try to get in contact with those folks to give yourself another perspective on what's happening in that country. It is vitally important that we are, are educated on this situation in Syria because of how deeply implicated uh, the U.S. government uh, and its allies are. Uh, with this situation. So thanks a lot, everybody, and join us next week at 8 o'clock now 
uh, for another uh, conversation uh, from a voice from the margin. Thank you so much. Thank you.